This episode of The Partially Examined Life is brought to you by St. John's College Graduate Institute, offering discussion-based master's degree programs for Western liberal arts or Eastern classics. Go to partiallyexaminedlife.com slash SJCGI for more information. The Partially Examined Life depends on your support. To find out how to do that in ways that are cheap or even free, go to partiallyexaminedlife.com slash support. You are listening to The Partially Examined Life, a podcast by some guys who at one point were set on doing philosophy for a living but then thought better of it. Our question for episode 160 is something like, what's the relationship between language and totalitarianism? And we read George Orwell's 1984 from 1949 and his essays Politics in the English Language from 1946 and Notes on Nationalism from 1945. To get the reading and more information, please check out partiallyexaminedlife.com. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer, double plus good in Madison, Wisconsin. This is Seth Paskin resisting thought crime in Houston, Texas. This is 6080R1W, belly feeling full wise double plus good anti duck speak full pearl feed in bicycle lane one Oceania. Bicycle lane one is just Cambridge. Sorry, I had to write something in these. <laughs> This is Dylan Casey in Middleton, Wisconsin, remembering reading 1984 and 1984. <laughs> wow. Whoa. Hey, I've got a question about that, Wes. So is there an actual dictionary or lexicon of Newspeak out there somewhere? At the back of the book. Yeah, there's an appendix, yeah. I just relied on the appendix. Oh, okay. Is there any speculation as to why he didn't write the book entirely in that, like, a la <laughs> Clockwork Orange? Because he had mercy on our souls. Except that it would have been uh, intolerable. <laughs> <laughs> he would not be able to say many of the things he wants to say. It's like if Wittgenstein had tried oh, to use point. only his allowed philosophical language. But you have to pull up the ladder behind yourself. You have to state the meta rules in language that is impermissible in the language. There you go. So I, I was proud of myself for figuring out how to say podcast as a duck speak full pearl feed, which required me to figure out how to turn the noun into the adjective with the full. And then I don't know if you guys remember from the novel, duck speak can be a compliment or an insult. That's right. And uh, pearl feed is just sort of the entertainment for the masses. So I thought that was. <laughs> <laughs> I was pleased with my own cleverness. <laughs> I am pleased with your cleverness as well. Once I've explained it, yeah. Perhaps we should lay the foundation for the melting pot. We could not but but help to be impelled to do so. Well, we should uh, just give a little bit of Orwell's bios since it's so relevant. Um, you're just going to let my un the thing that Orwell specifically forbid, you're just going to let that go by? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to treat that as a regular utterance? Mark, there are no laws or rules. We all just do what we know is right because we don't know. We only do what's good because how does that go? Sorry, what do you, you... Mark said he wants to state our ground rules, but in Oceania, there are no laws and there are no rules. I was just purposefully using things uh, oh, right. forbidden explicitly by his politics in the English language thing, that whenever you rely on a lot of turns of phrase, such as melting pot or um... give rise to, be subjected to, exhibit a tendency to, oh. etc., plastic bestial atrocities, stand shoulder to shoulder. There are many, many phrases he doesn't like. He thinks that when you use these hackneyed things, yes. then you are not thinking. It stands to reason. Right, okay. And we could give our ground rules based on his rules in the Politics in the English Language essay, which are, number one, never use a metaphor, or simile, or other figure of speech which you're used to seeing in print. Number two, never use a long word where a short one will do. Number three, if it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. However, our editors will handle that. Number four, never use the passive when you can use the active. Well, that's the only one that survived here. Number five, never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. That's useful for us. And number six, break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. <laughs> so I don't know if we can keep with that last one. I think we need our barbarism. Well, you do at least. Well, fuck you, Seth. <laughs> Barbarism is not the same thing as entertaining. It can be. <laughs> <laughs> what would count as barbarism? What does he what does he mean? I interpret it as as his anti American don't be coarse. Well he specifically says this isn't about Americanisms, no. about ruling out Americanisms. 
I think it pretty plainly just means the first five rules are guidelines and they can be broken, but just don't be a complete donkey head. <laughs> well, I think what, he, what he's saying is that you could, by strict adherence to the rules, you could do the very thing that he's arguing you shouldn't do. And so the, basically the whole thesis of this is that ugly and accurate language leads to foolishness, including political foolishness, because... When you sort of when you use stale imagery and when you avoid the uh, the concrete in favor of abstraction and stringing together prefabricated phrases, it's a way of letting the language do the thinking for you. It's a way of avoiding doing any actual thinking and sort of reverting to a kind of automatism or turning yourself into a machine and making it as unconscious as possible, which is something that really is he sees as indispensable. One of the great things about Orwell, he's always applying the principle of self-application. He says, yep, I just broke a lot of these rules within this essay, and this is something we all tend to do. One of the bits of advice here is he wants you to let concrete meanings determine the word, rather than letting abstract words point you in the direction of vague meanings. So it's conceivable you could have some concrete thing that you have in mind that requires you to break a rule. And so rather than not breaking a rule and then disobeying that more fundamental recommendation, you should break it if you have to, if you need it to mean what you mean. Yeah, to remain rooted in the world, which is another way of saying staying concrete. I think that was a great summary of us. And I think it's right to point out that if there's a great enemy for Orwell, it's over and needless abstraction, which has a political dimension to it. Mm Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's the evil of scientism, authoritarianism, and all kinds of other horrible things. He did so much writing about this, a lot of which we didn't read, but he's a democratic socialist, but he was reacting to the excesses of Stalinism. And part of that is just, you know, all the terrible things that were happening under Stalin, but there's also a matter of the fact that Stalin had widespread support among left-wing intellectuals in Britain at the time, and people were willing to overlook everything that was going on in the USSR all the time. And so Orwell, there's stories he tells, because he's basically a Marxist, basically a socialist, he just dissents from a specific brand of socialism. You know, he has a lot of experience in the party, and he talks of listening to IRA party members give speeches, and they're giving speeches to proletarians, basically, to working-class English people. And he was really blown away by the difference between abstract, Marxist style of language that these party leaders were using, and then the type of language the average working-class English person would use and understood and would identify with. So in some ways, it's an attempt to vindicate common human or English decency and common sense in the face of one of the excesses of any political movement can naturally fall into. The tendency towards abstraction, the tendency towards oligarchy parallels that tendency towards abstraction and the use of language in the way that he's talking about. Yeah, so of course we're going to talk about the more normal part of the discussion. Political aspects is this picture in 1984 of the society he's sketching out. Is this a prediction? You know, exactly what frame are we supposed to to take that? But given that this is a novel and not a piece of philosophy, not a straight-up statement, but this whole language thing seemed to be a very rich part of that to explore, just what you were talking about before, Wes, about duck speak is the extreme of falling into these cliches. You're talking the party line. You're spouting phrases that you've heard before. You're not formulating anything newly. You're not engaging in actual thought. Right. And it can be a term of abuse or a compliment depending on which party line you're speaking. Well, in the story, it can be a compliment. <laughs> in general, though, yeah. But if we were going to use it... <laughs> Or if Orwell himself was going to use it, it would always be an insult. Yeah, I guess it's a new speak word. But anyway, so the evaluation is whose party line are you quacking? If you're quacking the right one, it's an endorsement. If you're quacking the wrong one, then it's a criticism. But the criticism, it's not a matter of whether you're thinking for your offering arguments. It's just a matter of partisan alignment. And since you bring that up, we might as well just throw out what the third essay that we read was about, this notes on nationalism, that just like in our Rorty discussion, we talked about the difference between movements on the one hand and individual campaigns on the other hand. Here he talks about the difference between patriotism, which he thinks is a very concrete love of your fellow concrete people, the land you actually live in, versus nationalism, which he thinks doesn't necessarily refer to the nation, it could refer to the party. I would think it would be better, called factionalism. It's any group, though. You could define it by ethnicity, you could define it by nation, you could define it by religion. Yeah. 
and it doesn't even necessarily have to be one that you are part of. Like he's saying that the English intelligentsia, they're taking the part of the communists, the Stalinists in particular in Russia, that through a transferred nationalism, in other words, it's not something they were born with, but you might think that's weird, but that's the nature of this picking a faction that you're going to then be the serious man, to use Simone de Beauvoir's term, yeah. and put its interests above your own judgment and your own will, really. And the well-being of individuals. Yep. I mean, it bears repeating that it's notes on nationalism, but it's not what we mean by nationalism. He's trying to expand the meaning here. So here's a quick quotation. By nationalism, I mean, first of all, the habit of assuming that human beings can be classified like insects and that whole blocks of millions or tens of millions of people can be confidently labeled good or bad. But secondly, and this is much more important, I mean the habit of identifying oneself with a single nation or other unit, placing it beyond good and evil and recognizing no other duty than that of advancing its interests. It's worth reading the companion. Nationalism is not to be confused with patriotism. By patriotism, I mean devotion to a particular place and a particular way of life, which one believes to be the best in the world, but has no wish to force on other people. Patriotism is in its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally. Nationalism, on the other hand, is inseparable from the desire for power. The abiding purpose of every nationalist is to secure more power and more prestige, not for himself, but for the nation or the other unit in which he has chosen to sink his own individuality. Yep. And I think the chosen part is important there. That is not in the way that folks think maybe identity politics is determined by what group that you actually belong to. No, you can choose even to ally yourself with people in another country, maybe people you don't even know that much about. Yeah, but you can do that with identity politics as well, right? This word nationalism to me is just the 1940s word for identity politics. And it's the same thing. It doesn't have to be one's own group. It could be any group you want to identify with for any reason. Should we, before we get into the discussion proper, give a few thoughts? I know Seth had even considered doing a separate recording on this, or I was urging him to. So even though the most recent things that the folks listening have heard is probably our Confucius and Boethius episodes, for us, Rorty and political episodes kind of just hit the newsstands and the flood of traffic that we got from that. So it really gave us a lot to think about. We really appreciate all the comments. We're going to do a lot of traditional philosophy still, but we're going to keep doing some more of these things of current relevance. And in fact, the next one, just so you know that we're not just bringing up identity politics to dismiss it, to throw it aside. We're actually going to do identity politics for the next episode. Are we doing identity politics or white privilege? Oh, sorry. White privilege. That's one of the components of identity politics. I like the passage in Notes on Nationalism that Dylan read. The idea that patriotism is defensive and nationalism is aggressive in some respect. What's interesting to me is that a clear distinction between the two, he mentions sort of offhand in the essay that they're to be found in the same individual and that I think maybe there are elements of both. There's a voluntary identity and then a non-voluntary identity, each of which comes along with its own baggage. And the voluntary identity, it has some kind of function in identification that's designed to separate or exclude others or separate and distinguish one from others. So I found that the essay to be really enlightening, but at the same time, it was almost like it was a linguistic exercise or a conceptual exercise in distinguishing the two things, but that I don't think of them as two separate things in reality, two clearly distinguishable things in reality. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as a democratic socialist, he thought that patriotism could actually form the basis of a revolution. There could be a revolutionary patriotism. And he thinks nationalism is quite the opposite. It is the mechanism by which the revolution is betrayed. Why would that be if you were, you know, a diehard communist and searching for communist revolution in your country? Why would that be the mechanism by which it is betrayed? So what he saw, so here's just to get into a little bit of the biography. He went to Spain to fight in the Spanish Civil War on behalf of, so there was a communist Spanish government at the time and Franco was fighting and the Republicans were fighting against it. And you had a lot of different people go over there to help fight against the Republicans, including different communist factions. And the one that he ended up fighting for was PUM, or the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification, I think is what that stands for. So if you read Homage to Catalonia, which is a great book, in the beginning, what he sees is that there's actual working class people are in control of things, and it's great. What happens, though, and it's the same thing that happened in Stalinist Russia, is a distrust 
of the workers. And so power quickly gets concentrated in an oligarchical fashion among a few people, and they actually crack down on the working class. So there was actually a point where Spanish police went in and they took away, I think it was some sort of industry that had been occupied by the workers. And ultimately, they declared... <laughs> Orwell's faction as collaborationists with the fascists, as Trotskyist, and even tried Orwell in absentia. And that, so they actually was actually fighting between the more hardcore communists and this Poom faction. So that kind of betrayal of the revolution, the betrayal of revolution in Stalinist Russia, where the same sort of thing happened, is what informs a lot of this. And so when he's talking about nationalism, if you look at the characteristics he sort of harps on, it goes from a concern for actual individual human beings and their needs and their sort of control of the means of production and all that to just a concern for power and a concern for prestige and the superiority of one's own side. He harps on those things a lot, and he'll harp on that in 1984. The role that a pure desire for power plays and the way that betrays the revolution. And in fact, a willingness to pervert the intent of a revolution and speak of it in such a way that actually betrays it explicitly. I mean, in 1984, you get the, you know, complete reversal of speech, which is, seems like, you know, the end game of that kind of activity, but where you would pervert the freedom of the workers into the subjugation of the workers and the freedom of the individual into the obliteration of the individual. Yeah. So here's a quotation relevant to that. Nationalism, on the other hand, in contrast to patriotism, is inseparable from the desire for power. The abiding purpose of every nationalist is to secure more power and more prestige, not for himself, but for the nation or other unit in which he has chosen to sink his own individuality. And we'll see in 1984, we get this whole speech on the motivation for authoritarianism, which in this case, in the 1984, is pure, simply pure power. It's not a matter of wanting the good and falling into the era of putting the ends above the means and so and having the ends justify the means and doing terrible things to bring about one's conception of the good. It's actually the good just is power. It's the identification at the extreme limit. That's what happens. The good just is power for one's own group. Justifying one's actions as the end justifies the means is so passe at that point. You don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. See, I think a good way maybe for us to introduce what he's saying in 1984 is to not do what the book does, which is to, you know, throw you in through the eyes of one of its participants who does not have much information and, and just, you know, telling about the environment. But just to jump right into the, the book by Emmanuel Goldstein, who is the Trotsky villain that is villain as proclaimed by the party, which is the dominant totalitarian entity ruled by Big Brother, ostensibly. But when the character becomes in the second third of the book, becomes officially a traitor, tries to join the underground, such as it is. I mean, that really just means one person that he hooks up with, who ends up not really even being an underground, and maybe there is no underground, but he is actually given a copy of this book authored by apparently the party itself, but that is masqueraded, you know, that is kind of just put as a MacGuffin, as a, or what, a, a false flag? What, what would it be? That, something that the party is putting forward as the traitorous thing that we can put in your hands just so we can nab you for having it. But surprisingly, it like explains in a truthful way right. the setup of the society. So it's actually is just as good as if it was written by the underground. And the character later says, oh yeah, of course, the, all that's part about how to fight it is nonsense. But yeah, it's pretty much describes what went down. I was taking this as kind of his version of Marx's picture of history, that at least according to this, whether it's what all societies must do or something, this is at least not just what this one totalitarian society did, but what the three that between them cover the entire earth, all of them coming from different ideological starting points, end up at virtually the same place. So that to me sounds like it's at least putting it forward as hypothetically, satirically, who knows what Oral's actual view is, but in the book is being put forward as this is the way history moves. Do we need to give a quick rundown of the book itself? I mean, I don't mean the book in the book. I mean, 1984. The whole thing is he's just giving a picture of this society. And the plot, the way that he does it is by showing it through the eyes of one of the citizens who is dissatisfied, but basically obeying the rules. 
And then in the second third, he starts breaking the rules, mainly because he falls in love. He's able to, that's one of the things that's forbidden. He starts breaking the rules immediately, right, with the diary. Yep. Yeah. You find out he's broken the r- rules, essentially. He's been conscious of these rules earlier. The apartment that he picks, in terms of the question of thought crime, he's, he's been breaking it for a long time. Yeah. At the end of chapter one, part one, chapter one, he's already talking about the inevitability, the fact that he's going to yes. be caught and for his thought crime and vaporized. So he knows what he's doing and he knows it's suicide because in this society, any sort of privacy is verboten. So just to have a diary and to be writing in it, which he can do only because there's a place in his apartment which is outside of the surveillance of these things called telescreens, which are omnipresent and monitor people. And they're they're both TV-like and you see things on them, but they also monitor you. But the thing to keep in mind is that it'll turn out by the end of this book that all of this is sort of preordained by... It turns out the main character, Winston Smith, is living a script that's already been written by his primary antagonist, O'Brien. This shop that Winston wanders into to find the notebook... There's lots of intimations that that's actually like a preset trap. He's basically been entrapped, and all of these things that he's doing that seem private or that seem rebellious, that they're sort of diabolically arranged by the authorities. So in the end, it's a very bizarre kind of situation. Is it clear that the woman who really is the instigator of the overt acts of rebellion is arranged? I don't recall that being said. We don't know, although... There's lots of signs of arrangement, you know, whether or not she's been subtly nudged in his direction. You know, in the beginning, in the whole two minutes hate scene, he runs into O'Brien and he runs into Julia. And it'll turn out that he's been in contact with O'Brien years before. So there's a dream of him being in a dark room and and O'Brien saying to him, or someone saying to them, which he later on realizes is O'Brien, we will meet in the place where there is no darkness. So how the whole Julia thing is set up is unclear. There's a whole bunch of it that is a kind of script you find out. But I think there are open questions regarding like where did it become a script and where did it not? Julia may be one in particular case where it seems to be an opportunism going on in the story. So for instance, he finds himself wandering back to the shop, Charrington's shop called Weeks. And then Charrington, who is a member of the Thought Police, says, oh... Why don't you come see the room upstairs, which turns out to be a bedroom with a bed where he can have some privacy with Julia. So that's obviously a setup, and it turns out not to be the private place they thought it was. There's a hidden telescreen. So it's that sort of stuff that's all over the place in the book. In the end, he talks about this being a seven-year process Mm -hmm. and how everything started, I guess, when he separated from his wife uh, or somewhere around that time. So my read of it is that he, over time, must have been reading the signs to be complicit in what was being shaped. And instead of fighting it, in essence, he sort of fulfilled the prophecy. And another piece of evidence for the fact that this was all arranged is that everybody around him is implicated as well, right? He's like a cancer. Exactly. So, Syme is the first one to go, then Parsons and the uh, poet, whose name I can't remember... Ample forth. Ample forth, right. And of course, Julia. By the way, I listened to the book twice, this LibriVox version that was actually an excellent read. I think it was actually a commercial audiobook that somebody <laughs> posted there. But I got myself to thinking about the motives of the state of the thought police in why they would put so much effort into getting somebody to betray themselves and then to reform them. And that's one of the lingering questions I had coming out of it, is that if the whole purpose of power is the perpetuation of power, then there has to be this implicit understanding of how the perpetuation of power requires not subjugation and oppression in the sense of like Stalinism, but in some more insidious way, where you actually put people in a position where they have no choice but to essentially commit thought crime and then punish and rehabilitate them for it. It becomes a cycle. It's the grimmest thought. It's the grimmest perception of... I mean, it's not even totalitarianism. It's this weird conjunction of totalitarianism and Foucauldian power dynamics. Well, it's directed not just at behavior, but at the whole mind, the whole person. 
it makes Descartes' demon god look positively, you know, <laughs> cuddly. In that form, you maintain your individuality. You just don't know what's really true. But here, the winning is not the destroying of your body and, as Seth put it, the subjugation of your actions. But it depends upon converting you into betraying yourself as an individual, being broken, so that you really believe things that you didn't believe before. And so you lose your integrity as a human being in the most awful way possible. Before we continue our conversation, I want to talk about our sponsor, St. John's College Graduate Institute. The Graduate Institute is the master's degree granting arm of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Annapolis, Maryland. It's a program that's dedicated to the thoughtful reading of and serious conversation about the greatest books ever written. The classes at St. John's are much like PEL episodes. They are roundtable seminar discussions where the books are the teachers and the faculty members are tutors who come to learn as well. They don't simply dominate the conversation or ask leading questions. The students run the show. It's worth emphasizing, besides the fact that generous financial aid is available, two things about the Graduate Institute. You get to live in a great place while you're attending, and you have some flexibility about how quickly you complete the degree. There are actually two campuses. You can live in either Santa Fe, New Mexico, or Annapolis, Maryland. Both both towns are great historic towns, and you can actually transfer freely between those campuses while you're getting the degree. Both campuses have a summer term, and students can get their master's degree either in four summers, or they can continue their studies in the fall and spring. So it's convenient if you're a teacher or retiree, can, completing a degree in four summers is a convenient way to go. But if time is a factor, the fastest way to complete a degree is just to begin in summer and continue on for four semesters, which will give you a degree in hand by August of the following year. While you're attending the Graduate Institute, you can stay on campus for the summer term in both Annapolis and Santa Fe. If you're in Santa Fe, you can live on campus year-round. The Graduate Institute is currently accepting applications. There's no application fee, and the only requirement is a bachelor's degree in any field. If you are a PEL citizen, fan, or even casual listener with an interest in joining other like-minded individuals in a more formal, intimate setting to engage in the serious contemplation of the great works of literature, philosophy, history, theology, mathematics, and science, please check out the St. John's College Graduate Institute. For more information, visit partiallyexaminedlife.com slash sjcgi. That's partiallyexaminedlife.com slash sjcgi. This podcast is also sponsored by GoDaddy. You probably know them as the world's largest domain registrar. We use them for that purpose, but they're more than that. GoDaddy is the world's largest technology provider dedicated to small business with everything you need to get your business online. GoDaddy's mission is to radically shift the global economy toward life-fulfilling independent ventures, helping their customers kick ass by giving them the tools, insights, and the people to transform their ideas and personal initiative into success. With more than 14 million customers worldwide and more than 62 million domain names under management, GoDaddy gives small business owners the tools to name their idea, build a beautiful online presence, attract customers, and manage their business. They've got award-winning 24-7 support to help build your online business. Whether you have a new idea or an established business, the key to success online starts with a great domain name. GoDaddy is trusted by 13 million customers more than any other registrar. You're going to get big savings over other registrars. Please go to GoDaddy.com and get 30% off all new products and enter the coupon code PEL30 at checkout. That's GoDaddy.com, coupon code PEL30. We all need to take better care of ourselves, and taking care of our mental health is no exception. That's why today's sponsor, Talkspace, the online therapy company, makes it easy to connect with an experienced, licensed therapist, handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. Using Talkspace, you can send your therapist text, audio, and video messaging whenever you want, or even do a live video chat. Do you want to vent about your work and family or talk through something that's been on your mind? No problem. Your therapist is ready to help. To sign up or learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash examined. And as a special offer for our listeners, you can use the coupon code examined to get $30 off your first month and show your support for this podcast. That's Talkspace.com slash examined, offer code examined. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. All right, let's get back to it. 
So you can imagine before this whole, as O'Brien calls it, this drama that I have played out with you during seven years. So O'Brien explicitly says this near the end. O'Brien starts that drama. O'Brien, I think the evidence is that he leads Winston astray and even into getting the diary and, and all the other stuff. And if he'd left Winston alone, Winston is not the kind of guy. I mean, the picture of him you get from the very beginning, he's not the rebel. He's completely beaten down. And it, he's so lifeless in a sense, it actually takes the prodding of the party to get him to do anything rebellious. It's almost like he's too lacking in rebellion. And that, in a way, there's a sort of absence of control on that. They need him to have something that they can stomp out of him. Totally. And so they induce that in him. He would not have pursued Julia. She had to intentionally get in his path, and she had to approach him. I think once he has the diary, a lot of it's set in motion in the sense that he's become reflective, right? A lot of the book is him in reverie. Just the inducement of reverie and thoughtfulness, you can imagine there's very little of that in the society, and it's kind of a miracle that he can do that. And, and in a way, O'Brien, it's almost, it looks like O'Brien has done him a favor, made him more human. It's the latest upgrades with the reveries that made him <laughs> extra human. Yeah, I know. I got world I got joke. That. <laughs> he mentions right before he starts talking about, it's shortly after, shortly before, that he had stopped attending nightly meetings. He says the party always has you doing something that you're always engaged in. And so probably, you know, one of the first signs is failure to show up to do something or failure to show up at a particular meeting or what have you. And Parsons has to come and get the $2 for hate week from him. He's clearly not engaged. And that opens the space. He's not exhausted from work and then completely occupied in party activities where he can sit and actually write in his diary. And then, of course, what he writes is interesting. Yeah. I want to ask about Parsons now, but I don't know if it's too soon to ask about. We have the different people coming in in the, in the third section when Winston is being converted in that whole horrible process. And Parsons gets betrayed by his daughter. But he's, of course, gleeful about this. And on the one hand, sort of petrified, but on the other hand, figures that this is the way it works. And it made me wonder if Parsons is an example of someone who is already where Winston is at the end, or is there a different, you know, a kind of conversion that's going to have to happen with Parsons? Or is he basically there already, that two plus two equals five, as far as Parsons is concerned? He's one of the type, very explicitly, who doesn't understand things enough to really rebel, yep. that he's basically just an idiot and a follower. So the thing that his daughter, that he gets nailed for is he's talking in his sleep and saying, down with the party, which could be, you know, just something. Down with big brother. Down with big brother, you know, some perversion the kind of thing that happens in dreams. You you do the forbidden. What else are you supposed to do in dreams? I, I will say that is a little bit odd, though, because this, at the end of chapter one, you know, as Winston comes back from a reverie, he finds himself automatically writing over and over again in his diary, down with Big Brother. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's odd that the same phrasing. Yeah, so it makes you wonder if it's a human knee-jerk reaction to the kind of activity of this society with Big Brother, or is it something implanted in people's dreams already, that there's some kind of subliminal messaging, that the control is actually going that deep, that people are being induced to rebel in certain ways, and then putting them in this queue of being rehabilitated. And Parson's path is less horrifying than Winston's, but only because he's a numbskull and Winston isn't. They make it clear that the kind of rehabilitation that Winston is going through, which results in him confessing to all these things, even that he didn't do. I don't know if you saw that. I, I watched the clip from the movie from the end where he's explicitly saying like, oh yeah, I led uh, enemy bombers to target the, like just confessing to all these things that he had nothing to do with at all, just because he would confess to anything. That's at least in the book, explicitly what he says is what did happen to these yep. You know, exactly. Many people in the past are the, the examples of traitors that are trotted out on TV to raise people's ire. And in particular, he's talking about, you know, a group of three that were party loyalists. It's Rutherford and Banks and Collins or something. Nobody got the Genesis joke. Anyway. Only you, Mark. <laughs> 
Only prowls sing, Mark. The party does not sing. They disappear for a while while they're being rehabilitated, and then they appear again with these public confessions for a while, so they can kind of be seen in public, but like pretty much just dispirited hanging out in a cafe. And then they disappear for good. And this is just what happens to everybody that is arrested in that way. And it's very clear, even though we do not see Winston get killed at the end. Yeah, he's going to get shot. Yeah. So that's, we can't say, Dylan, that everybody goes through some program of rehabilitation in anything like this. Not everybody gets shot. Really? You think he's going to get shot at the end? O'Brien tells him it may not happen for a long time. Oh. And then he says, you know, he knows it's going to happen. Something about getting shot in the back of the head or something along those lines. I do agree with Mark that whatever Parsons is going to go through and Ample Thorpe, I mean, Ample Thorpe is not smart enough to be in Winston's place. And, you know, he just made a mistake. Parsons, I think, is actually a more complicated case in some extent. But what's interesting is that you could say that the down with Big Brother, quote unquote, rebellion is the same as saying, I hate Big Brother. And at the end of the book, the last line of the book is, you know, he loved Big Brother. And O'Brien makes a point of saying that the goal of the thought police is to destroy love to destroy love of parents, children for parents, love between man and man, and love between man and a woman, that only the only love can be for, for, except for the love of big brother. So there's a sense in which, Dylan, I think you might be right, that there's this, in the same sense that there's black, white, and double speak or double think, which is the ability to hold contradictory ideas in your head and, I guess, believe them both to be true or that it's almost like a contradiction that needs to be at the heart of it, which is they cannot get people to love Big Brother if they do not get people to hate Big Brother. And that this whole process of conversion is around somehow around that. And down with Big Brother, that's not a phrase that real rebels would really use. That's the type of thing the authoritarian regime accuses you of, right? Yeah. Mm. They make that up. That's their words. That's true. So there's the question of waste. If you could rehabilitate people, so that they could be good workers for Big Brother, that would be useful. But what they do to people in terms of just breaking them down completely, you know, Winston is basically a mess. Like they do give him a job, but it's basically, they make it clear it's a sinecure. It's a, it doesn't really involve any real work. He's not being productive in the way that he was in the Ministry of Information or whatever they call it beforehand. Mini truth. Yes. Ministry of truth, yeah. I watched Brazil between <laughs> this weekend, too, to, to compare. It's the Ministry of Information in Brazil. And in England, his wife worked for the censorship department. Orwell's wife worked for the censorship department of the Ministry of Information in England. Well, he worked for the BBC. I don't know if that's part of the Ministry no. of Information. He was, he was a propagandist, briefly. Yeah, he did work for the BBC, but his wife really did work as a censor in the Ministry of Information. Uh-huh. Well, and it doesn't matter what kind of job he has, because even the job he had in the Ministry of Truth was, isn't it in the book, Goldstein's book, that he says, you know, the whole purpose is to, for the country to generate just enough wealth, but to keep people impoverished and to be perpetually at war, to, you know, drain the resources just for the purposes of maintaining power, and that only the inner party members actually do any real work anything of value. Is it not the case that the revision of history that happens a couple different times in the book and one time, you know, to great effort, right? They're working 16 hour days for weeks when the enemy of Oceana changes and Winston's good at this and Julia's working her butt off and they hardly see each other. I guess I took that to be, you know, true mechanics, right? You don't know how many times it's happened, but I I didn't get the sense that that activity was empty, that it was a cool hand Luke kind of, you know, digging a hole and then filling it in again, but was actual, you know, revision of history that then happened again. You don't know how long it's been going. You, You have no reason to believe there's actually any way of untying the destruction that has been wrought, but it is actual revision that's happened. I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. I just think that there's no sense in which we think that Winston's skill at doing it is anything exceptional and that he's he's not replaceable or is doing anything generative. 
he's not deciding what needs to be revised, that happens somewhere else. Well, except for his own testimony to how good he is at it and O'Brien's flattery of him. Now, it may be that O'Brien is merely flattering him. Well, I think Syme flatters him. Like, there's a few places. Like, yeah, you write good article. It's basically yeah. like writing news stories. It's just that they're fake news stories. Some of them are created to replace old news stories that, well, we can't have a story about that person because that person has been disappeared and we need to make them expunged from all records. In some cases, he can just change a name or change a date or change a location, but sometimes he has to write something completely fresh and he has to do it in newspeak, I guess. So it takes some skill. So page 55 to 56, Winston's greatest pleasure in life was in his work. Most of it was a tedious routine, but included in it, there were also jobs so difficult and intricate that you could lose yourself in them as in the depths of a mathematical problem, delicate pieces of forgery in which you had nothing to guide you except your knowledge of the principles of Ingsoc, English socialism, and your estimate of what the party wanted you to say. So what's interesting about that is he's also horrified by the result. He's horrified by the fact that the party is basically destroying any evidence of the past and destroying any sort of bearings for figuring out what's true and what's not true. But the work itself is his greatest pleasure. Yeah, because mm-hmm. in some ways he's unraveling, even if it's only true for a few moments or hours or maybe days, he's unraveling that problem with the inputs and outputs that would be required of preserving history. It can't be kept up. It can't expand into a larger endeavor. But he's asserting himself as an individual, right? He's discovering new things. He's acting as a creative individual entity. And he also, in those moments... Yes, if they, if they advertise that job, they would use the word creative a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also the case that in those moments, he is like any musician or scientist when he finds that thing that's new. He's the only one that knows about it. And that's the juice for it. And he's good at it. And that's why he loves it. And that's exactly what, you know, when they break him, he can't do that work anymore. Why? Because they obliterated him as an individual. One of the bizarre characteristics of the push of power for power is that it ends up obliterating the very juice that's in there. And it makes me wonder, what is someone like O'Brien, right? Isn't O'Brien's work with Winston like Winston's work with Newspeak? And how isn't there a whole story of O'Brien? where O'Brien has his own other O'Brien, and he was playing the Winston character. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting that he says he's, I was caught long ago or something, but yet he hasn't been shot. He's not a shell of a person who can barely function. Like he's, you know, No, he's, he's in fact engaging in this very intricate, highly individual, creative work. I mean, it's horrible, but it, that's what it is. Yeah, it's interesting when O'Brien first walks into the cell in the final section, and Winston says to him, they got you too. And O'Brien responds, they got me a long time ago. With his typical... But he's inner party, so maybe the rules are different. Yeah, I thought maybe he was referring to the fact that, again, in Goldstein's book, which O'Brien says he wrote or co-wrote, they say that there's the exam when you turn 16 and outer party members can be elevated and inner party members can be demoted. So maybe he was indoctrinated at an early age. Yeah, it could be, but O'Brien's existence by itself sort of gives lie to the whole activity, right? I mean, unless O'Brien himself is somehow Big Brother, which maybe there's this kind of way in which all the O'Briens that run the inner party are Big Brother in some way, like they're all Negan. But O'Brien's activity requires him not to be the way Winston is at the end. I don't see how he can do the activity he's doing and be a broken man. Unless there's something about the love of power and the pursuit of power for power's sake that animates him so thoroughly that he preserves his activity and is able to double think his way through existence. I don't think so. But then maybe that's just me. Well, let's maybe get the rest of this picture of the society, just so we're, we're clear what, you know, the inner versus the outer party, as far as the historical bit. So this is in the book by Goldstein, chapter one, which is in our book, the second section, book nine, my version, it's page 166. 
you know, it's several pages. I don't want to read the whole thing, of course, but it's a story of just, you know, throughout history, there are always three classes. There's the high, the middle, and the low. And even though there's a lot of rhetoric about equality and actually bringing the low up, he says, from the point of view of the low, no historic change has ever meant much more than a change in the name of their masters. So that progress through history is just a certain middle class grows in strength, deposes the high class, and becomes the high class. Never, even if they do so in the name of universal fraternity or freedom or justice, it never turns out that way. They always just become the new boss. So what this thing that Ingsoc has developed and the other two, you know, Ingsoc being the government of the Oceanic Society, and then there's the East Asian and the, what's the other one? Eurasian. Purposefully named similarly, and they keep, you know, sometimes they're at war with one, sometimes they're at war with the other, but they're kind of indistinguishable as far as the populace goes, because they never see anybody from the foreign countries other than, you know, as somebody trotted out who's about to be executed. But there's no immigration. So Ingsoc and the respective governments in these other two countries decide, you know, to freeze the process that we're not going to let the middle grow. We have to develop defense mechanisms for our current high status so that it'll never switch up again. And so that's what this entire creation of new speak insistence on dominating the minds of it's actually just the middle class. They don't care about the low class. The low class is the poles. Uh, you know, restricted of any access. Yeah, the proles. They're restricted of any access to education. They're systematically destroying all the literature or, you know, replacing it. And, you know, they keep a lookout if there aren't any particular threatening characters among the proles. They just disappear them. But they don't really care. They're, the proles are never going to undergo, you know, temptation and reformation. Like, they're not important. The only thing important is to keep them down, is to keep the economic prosperity that is given by machines, like, well, that should, per our new work episode, make it so the mass of people don't live in toil anymore. But if that happened, that would get rid of inequality and threaten the people in power. So the people in power can't allow that. So that's why they have war to eat up that effort, to eat up the material resources, to keep the low down, and then to keep the middle not only down, but working for them, doing these things like this revision of history that Winston's job is. And Julia has a similar, you know, creating educational materials job, creating porn is one of the aspects. These are all things that the party needs to stay in power. And so they need to control the middle class, the outer party, you know, by all this mind fucking. And we don't get to hear about like how the inner party polices itself. Apparently, as we've been discussing, it's already internalized, apparently. Just one emendation to that. This whole high, middle, low thing gets complicated, but the inner party arises out of the salaried middle class. So on page 259, the new aristocracy was made up for the most part of bureaucrats, scientists, technicians, trade union organizers, publicity experts, sociologists, teachers, journalists, and professional politicians. These people whose origins lay in the salaried middle class and the upper grades of the working class had been shaped and brought together by the barren world of monopoly industry and centralized government. As compared with their opposite numbers in past ages, they were less avaricious, less tempted by luxury, hungrier for pure power, that's really important, and above all, more conscious of what they were doing and more intent on crushing opposition. This last difference was cardinal. By comparison with that existing today, all the tyrannies of the past were half-hearted and inefficient. The ruling groups were always infected, to some extent, by liberal ideas, and so on and so on. So it's the illiberal, salaried, elite, middle class where this all comes from. They go from middle to high, and then they stay there. They figure out how to stay there. But we were saying the way to get into high is you take a test when you're 16, not that potentially you know this temptation of Winston could be a, a test. Had he passed? No, no. Maybe he'd be part of the high. It seems like the kind of thing, the dickish thing they would do. Hmm. So like I said, I listened to this. I don't have the text in front of me, but I remember him saying something about that there used to be mechanisms for the middle to wrest power away from the high, but that that has ceased to be possible. It's essentially the consolidation of power. All the stuff they do to Winston, right? I mean, that's just one piece of it. But So this is on page 271. What the essence of all this is, 
is that past oligarchies failed because they either became too ossified and inflexible and trying to be infallible, or if they let any liberal ideas in, they were too soft and they got overthrown. So they died of their own inflexibility or their own liberality. And the only way around that is this double think. The only way around that is to be both at once. Ah. So to maintain power, you have to combine your belief in your own infallibility with the ability to learn from one's mistakes, which means accepting contradictory beliefs simultaneously, being conscious and unconscious at the same time, being able to tell deliberate lies while genuinely believing them. That's how they maintain power. You know, he tries to isolate this particular method of power from other things like white privilege, white supremacy, for instance. He says, this is actually the part where they talk about how you get in the inner party. In principle, membership of these three groups is not hereditary. The child of the inner party parents is, in theory, not born into the inner party. Admission to either branch of the parties by examination, taken at the age of 16, nor is there any racial discrimination or any marked domination of one province by another. Jews, Negroes, South Americans of pure Indian blood are to be found in the highest ranks of the party, and the administrators of any area are always drawn from the inhabitants of that area. In no part of Oceania do the inhabitants have the feeling that they are colonial population ruled from a distant capital. Oceania has no capital, etc. So I don't know if that's... These are the details of the way I'm setting up the thought experiment, or in the second half of our discussion, at least, we should get into whether we think he thinks this is a trend, you know, whether inevitable or not. This is, of course, very different from many other folks that we would read that you can't just wave away colonialism. And, you know, colonialism, of course, something he was extremely aware of. He had participated in it. And, you know, it, it is one of the main things he was against as far as wrote a lot about. And yeah. 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 But in this book, you know, I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with, I'm focusing on something else. And so this is the one sentence where I'm just sweeping that away and saying, yes, okay, that is something that is a, an issue now, but that is not inherent to power dynamics. And in fact, yeah, you don't need that at all. So any, any thoughts to conclude the setup here of the society? Any other details that we've left out or important well, stuff? I, I think we've been really pointing to the issue being about power and the power for power's sake. Yeah, we'll have to read some of you know of Brian's explanation and his wonderful foot stomping on the face account <laughs> right at the end. Yeah. Because really we you know what I think what we'll want to talk about in the second half of this as well is whether this idea of the reason that of whether pure power is realistically a motivation for all of this and and that type of thing. But the other thing I think we should I just want to mention now is that there's this you know the other part of the theme of the book is intimacy and privacy and what's represented by his diary and his mother and um, love and what you might call yeah and love and sex and what you might call place of darkness so this o'brien is going to meet him in the place where there is no darkness which if you think about it is really just the place of surveillance and complete lack of intimacy and complete lack of privacy although winston puts this very positive spin on it he thinks of it as this bright future where people have the freedom to say two plus two equals four, when in fact it's the torture room and it's surveillance and it's all of that stuff. It's the panopticon on steroids. Right. But the other part of this is, you know, when he initially he's concerned. So even though I said he loved his job, he also talks about this alteration of the past being something worse than torture. You know, even before this whole idea that he loves his job, he talks about it being worse than torture and death, like on page. 43 to 44, the erasure of the past horrifies him. And double think horrifies them. All of these things horrify him. But when he meets Julia, they don't horrify her. And she's bored by him going on and on about them. <laughs> she just wants to live and get as much pleasure as she can. And, and what she convinces him of is that, okay, none of that matters if I can have this intimate space within myself and then the room becomes a metaphor for that. Just the idea that the room exists becomes a comfort to him. But the main idea, though, is that he could have feelings for Julia, his love for her. They can't eradicate that. They may make him betray her, confess, say all the things she did and all that stuff. But it's one thing to do that with torture, and it's another thing to actually make him hate her. So that's the sense in which he thinks 
there's this domain of privacy which can survive anything. It can survive any amount of torture and thought control and so on. And what we find out is that they figured out a way that he's wrong about that, that by confronting him with his biggest fear, even though it's just for a moment, they can make him wish that Julia is the one having her face eaten by the rats instead of him. That's the real betrayal, and that's the sense in which that's the place where there is no darkness. There's no darkness because there's not even the darkness that would hide and allow him to have that inviolable feeling for Julia. Everything can be exposed to the light and crushed. All right, that sounds like a good end to part next one. Next week. <laughs> Come back next week for part two of our Orwell discussion. Come back for more. People can take a nice break and live a happy life before coming back to this vision of darkness or of eternal light, however you want to put it. Yeah, or become a personally examined life citizen and just get the rest of the dark vision right now by uh, going to partiallyexaminedlife.com and doing that and you won't have to listen to commercials anymore and your life will just uh, be double plus good. Today's show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company that believes that therapy should be affordable, confidential, and convenient. A Talkspace therapist can help put you on the path to a happier life. For a special offer to our listeners, visit Talkspace.com slash examined. Again, that's Talkspace.com slash examined.